Okay, sorry, I forgot that, but welcome again. <laughs> okay, so let's get started with this phases of learning. Um, if you were so lucky to listen to Chris's presentation on Monday, you would have learned this idea of phases of learning in greater detail. I'm simply going to summarize it. But when we think of phases of learning, we want to start with the surface phase. This is where students are developing concepts, basic knowledge about a concept. They are also developing skills that will be used in the later phases of learning. The deep phase is where students are now making connections between the concepts and they're developing their understandings. And then of course the transfer phase is where the students apply their understandings and skills of a concept through a variety of contexts. Now, it is important to mention that even though these presentations are in linear in fashion, they're not linear in practice, uh, you will need to find yourself floating back and forth from surface to deep several times as the students are exploring the various contexts of these concepts. Now, everyone has their strengths. <laughs> And uh, when I was working on this presentation with a dear colleague, I was getting very frustrated with the phases of learning. Um, and then this sweet guy named Ted <laughs> put it in my language and all of a sudden I got it. So I wanted to share his analogy today because it really did help me and maybe it'll help you too. Um, comparing the phases of learning to volleyball, the surface phase would be you know, the practices and specifically focusing on bumps and sets and serves and different drills to practice those specific skills. Um, the deep phase would be playing scrimmage or games in a game setting, but in a practice. Um, and then, of course, the transfer phase would be playing in a game against a new team. But a transfer phase could also be playing on a new volleyball team with new teammates. It also could be playing a whole new sport, like the idea of applying the concept of offense and defense and anticipating what's going to happen could be applied to a few different sports and not just volleyball. Again, with this analogy in mind, we don't stop practicing the surface, right? All of a sudden you get to college volleyball, you don't stop practicing bumping and setting and serving. Um, you might even get new things to think about to improve those skills. So you're constantly going back to that surface level. Um, when we learn those new things, we then move to the deep and this continues as we build our skills and understanding of the game. And then every time you play a new um, opponent, you're going to be getting a new transfer opportunity. Now for today's session, I will be only focusing on the matter organizing idea, just for simplicity's sake, we could be hanging out for weeks if I didn't do this. So <laughs> now the planning for the phases of learning, we wanna focus on the understanding. I'm um, going to quickly recap on how these phases of learning appear in our planning. As always, we could spend the whole session, if not more, on each phase. So the project-based learning, it's ultimately going to dig into the deeper phase today when we talk about it, um, but it's more important to fill in some of the background before we get there. The understanding of the cusp is I see it as the glue that holds everything together. So in kindergarten, we have two understanding statements. And again, this is what you see when you look at your curriculum. We have the organizing idea, the guiding question, the learning outcome, and then we have the knowledge, understanding, skills, and procedures. And for kindergarten, there's only one row. There's two understanding statements. The objects have identifiable properties and objects may be similar in one or more properties and different in another property. We're gonna go back to this, don't worry. 
Now we look at the knowledge column to figure out the key concepts required to build the understanding. That's highlighted in yellow. So what do these lists of concepts look like as a list? Well, those are all the concepts, right? Um, object senses, we're talking about the five senses, identifiable properties, and then obviously the similarities and differences. So this is the surface phase of learning. Now, when we're um, planning for the phases of learning, we want to see the key skills or procedures that the students are going to show or use to show their understanding and what we as teachers are going to use to assess their understanding. So here's an example of a grade one cusp. The key concepts are required to form the understanding that are, are highlighted in yellow and the skills and procedures that will be used to assess the understanding are highlighted in green. Just a quick note that we noticed as we work through this curriculum, some of the skills and procedures seem vague and could be interpreted many different ways. An example of this is identify, which I made in purple. Um, it can have various meanings depending on how it's interpreted. For example, identify in this case may mean recall which means, you know, you name the properties of objects that are measurable, or it may mean to find examples of the concept, which would be what measurable properties does this object have? I hope that makes sense to everyone. <laughs> um, again, identify when you look at it in purple is not a specific skill per se, it can have various meanings depending on how it's interpreted. For example, identify in this case likely means to analyze objects to determine the material used to create them. Now, the arrows on this page uh, are to show the purpose or sh show how the purpose connects to the understanding, even though it doesn't explicitly say that within the understanding, it's implied. Now with grade three, here's an example of one of the grade three cusps. Again, the yellow are the key concepts required to form the understanding and the green would be the key skills and procedures used to assess the understanding. Now going back to kindergarten, here's the kindergarten matter cusp. Now my final word of caution while doing this work is that when I first saw the kindergarten cusp, my middle son just finished kindergarten. So I felt like I totally understood where they were going. And I thought it was a very applicable thing for kindergarten. Um, but when I first saw it, I thought about, okay, five senses. So my idea was to go to different locations around our small town, you know, the skating rink, the curling rink, baseball diamonds, the grocery store, the fire hall, the bank, the post office. And we're going to just take in the five senses and document the five senses of each of those locations. But after I went back and looked at the outcome again, the cusp, it specifically says objects. It's not locations, right? So I had to tweak my ideas. I still think it's a great idea to go to different locations but we wanna focus on objects found at those locations. So the pucks and the Zambonis at the skating rink, right? The curling rocks, the, the baseballs, the baseball gloves, the fruits and vegetables at the grocery store, you know, the money at the bank, maybe packages and letters, right? But we need to focus on the objects specifically. In other words, you might wanna read the whole cusp and not just focus on one. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one thing when I was planning this, I totally had to pivot a little bit once I read the whole cusp. I said, exactly. And you know what, coming from someone, Pat, that has like 
the skating rink and the curling rink, that's different ice. I know it sounds silly, but if you curl and you play hockey or figure skate, you know that it's different ice. Um, in my small town, we have what's called the summer spiel. And so it's curling on August long weekend. And my husband's the president of the whole thing. And my boy's favorite thing is when it's finally over before they let the ice go, they go and take their, put their skates on and go skate on the curling rink. And they just think it's so fun. So I do think that ice would be a great one to talk about the five senses, but like, I mean, like I'm saying, we need to focus on the object. So ice is perfect, but not the entire building, which I was my original plan. <laughs> Okay, so this is, you know, ta-da, the list of the key concepts, skills, and procedures um, from the last slide. I just tried to make it a little, we've seen this before. I had it on an earlier slide. Um, now, some of you might be looking at this list and going, oh, crap. <laughs> um, so good news, if you're panicking, much of the work related to this surface level planning has been done. Um, so we, oh, I forgot to change that orange one, Chris, but the line, but, um, oh no, you did change it. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so if you click on any of these, depending on where you teach or what grade you teach, Chris also just put it in the chat box. Um, but if you click on kindergarten for kindergarten, and if you click on it, I'll show you, um, you can preview it before you decide to make a copy. Um, but there are great, all these links you have access to, to help you with instru instructional activities for these concepts. And they're surface level. They don't go very deep, but it's still an awesome resource. Oh, it says we need to request access. Uh-oh. I have put the links, I put the links inside your chat box. Can you grab those instead if it's if it's the slide deck that's asking you for access? Only for grade three can access, not for grade two. Are we working through the slide deck or through the links that I put in the chat box? Kinder, grade one, grade two, so it's just grade three. Through the links that you put in the um, chat box, the grade three one says you need to request access. Okay, let's see if we can, I don't know if I can change that, but I'll try. We just tweaked this yesterday afternoon, hey Chris, so I'm sorry about that. Yep, what she said. How's it going, Chris? I'm just going to see if it'll let me change your edit here. It should. Okay, let's just see here. Oh, okay, yeah, it's restricted. Oh, it is? Yeah, I got it. Oh, you have it, okay. All right, I'll grab a new grade three one and put it in the chat box for everyone. Somebody just let us know that you can get in. There is a link for this presentation. Um, yes, it's working right now. Okay, can you try that one? That's for grade three and see if you can get in. It works now. Thank you. Great. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. No, thanks, Chris. Sorry. I'm going to put the, this is a, the link to the Google Slides. There was someone back there that asked for a link to the presentation. Here you go. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. You guys have this, but 
please keep coming with me to the next slide. Um, so uh, we're gonna jump now to the deep phase of learning. The next phase, this is where you can think of case studies, different texts, different experiments, where you're connecting two or more concepts together. Um, if you think about a baking analogy, right? The surface level is where you're looking in the cupboard to see what ingredients you have and then going to the grocery store and buying the ingredients you don't have, right? Um, when you think about deep phase of learning and the baking analogy, we're going to take our ingredients and we're actually going to do the thing. We're going to bake the cookies. Now, a reminder that this is not a linear process. We're going to bounce back from surface and deep as our understanding grows. Um, our first context might be a basic chocolate chip recipe. We're not going to get too out of hand, right? The next progression might be adding cinnamon to the recipe or changing butter to mar and margarine. Maybe to get a whole cookie, a new cookie recipe, but using usually like the same ingredients, but different ratios. But let's begin with deep. So our understanding of skills and concepts grow as we apply it to different contexts. Our work as teachers is to create these contexts that build upon each other and allow this to happen, right? So if we see on the left-hand side that the boxes would be like the ingredients, there are going to be two or more concepts in a statement, but those little boxes are representing the idea of the ingredients if we were to be baking. Now the clouds, are the context, the different experiences, situations, or environments. So that would be like the recipes. And the different clouds represent the different recipes, right? Um, the context grow in complexity as we change to different recipes. And that happens the same in the classroom when we're doing different contexts. So the next four slides are going to focus on the skills and procedures for each grade and how they connect or match up to the understanding. Simply put, when we are looking at these, I need you to ask yourself, how can we build out experiments, play centers, class conversations that will allow to build these understandings? Because you know that they have the surface knowledge of these key concepts, right? Um, you are welcome to spend a moment on your grade level slide, but I'm going to jump ahead to slide 25. So I'll just give you a second if you want to check it out. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. You are on it. <laughs> so um, just like the surface phase, they, these planners have been started for each of the grades. And just like before, we're not going to spend a ton of time here because I do want to get to that transfer phase with all of you. Um, but click on the link and you're going to see some great activities that are now in the deep level planning for each of the grades. Again, it's only for the matter organizing idea right now, but there's more to come, right, Chris? <laughs> so I'll let you click, do all the links work? Give me a thumbs up or is there anyone that's not working for you? Oh, a number of these activities that you've got listed on these sheets are also found within the documents, the slide decks that we have posted already. So you can always go there and grab them. Okay. 
Something about my cookies. Grade one is not working for me. Uh-oh. Sorry, go where? So on... Um, we can show you where to go. Yeah, on slide 25, if you were to click on the grade that or that you're going to be teaching. And, oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Oh, geez. That's so weird. This happens when you copy and paste the link in a new browser tab. Thanks, Corey. Hmm. So the grade one, you just click on sample activities, and this is for the deep level quick planner for instructional activities for the matter cusp, or the one of the matter cusps, I should say. Is it working now? Slides 22 and 24, but it looks like I cannot view them. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe just for now, just use the links in the chat. And then before we send this out to you, we'll make sure that those links work. OK, I have changed it. So slides 22 to 24 are no longer skipped. So you should see them now. I can access the links, but not from the presentation. Weird. Maybe we shouldn't play to, have played with them. There because... you go. You've got it. You just got a message. People have got it. But we can fix this after. They, they've got access through the chat box. Okay. Perfect. So these are great resources that... I'm pretty sure Chris is all about. She had made these, um, but they're amazing activities that'll just get you started, right? Okay, so now we're planning for the transfer phase of learning. This is the application of surface and deep learning to a new or novel situation. Um, transfer can be similar in context that you've already explored with your students, or it can be dissimilar. So if we go back to my baking cookies analogy, a similar transfer might be using the ingredients we have for another baked good, like squares or muffins, so very similar. A dissimilar example would be making like a savior, savory dish that could use some of the same ingredients and some of the same skills, but essentially is completely different than baking cookies. So something new, there are probably many activities you already do that fit into this curriculum perfectly. My advice, is to just not overthink it. There might be some new concepts that you haven't covered before, but don't worry. I do have a great collection of links to share with you. The new curriculum is structured differently than it has been in the past. I get that. But with change comes fresh ideas. The way it's structured with guiding uh, questions and organizing ideas, I believe that the beginning stages of project-based learning is already there. Uh, you might think of project-based learning as absolute chaos and teachers checking out and just leaving students to their own devices. But for me, it's a way to improve the buy-in. Every day we build and we relate back to the project. So you still do the teaching and do the work and work as a team, but you're always relating it back to the project. If it makes you feel better, we don't have to call it project-based learning. We could call it the final transfer task or, right, 
the, the critical challenge. But at the end of the day, we're constantly going back to that project. Um, no matter what you call it, we're asking students to bring together everything they've learned throughout our activities and apply it to some sort of question or problem. So project-based learning is where students collaborate to solve a problem in the real world. It's where students learn concepts and apply them in their project. I would encourage you to keep uh, begin with the end in mind. What do the students need to be able to do? You want to maybe get the students interested in a topic. So in my hometown, I feel like you just need to walk across the street from the school to the hockey rink or the curling rink or the ball diamonds to really get a lot of students hooked. Maybe there's a problem at the school that the students could come up, uh, come up uh, with a solution for, right? Another idea that I really like are called thought books. So this is where students pause and record their thinking throughout the unit of study to connect what they have learned via the surface and deep phases to the project in question. So this um, allows you to see their growth and their thinking over time. Um, these thought books I think would be a great way to show the progress and to get the kids to reflect. Um, in my own classroom, I'm currently teaching junior high and I'm totally paper free, but I think there's a place for these thought books to be on paper. I want, you know, I could see them being a little messier and it's easier to reflect back there. Okay, so I am going to show you this video. It's less than five minutes. And although it's pretty simple in nature, I really like his explanation on project-based learning. He doesn't overthink it. It's not like you're reinventing the wheel, so to speak. So let's take a listen. Can you do project-based learning in an elementary classroom? Is it possible when you have the same set of kids all day, but also have to teach reading and writing and social studies and science and social skills throughout the day as well? Well, the answer is unequivocally yes, because project-based learning really comes down to heightening student engagement with authenticity and purposeful work. And elementary students thrive on having purpose in their work as well. Instead of having students learn a concept or a set of concepts and then having them complete some type of activity afterwards, which is often how we think of projects, what project-based learning does is introduce a meaningful problem to students at the beginning of a learning experience, and then you frame all of the learning as a way of solving that problem. And so, of course, this can be done in elementary classrooms. And in fact, it's sometimes best done in elementary classrooms. Here's why. One of the reasons PBL is so effective is because it makes the learning relevant for students. They're getting to see how the content that they're learning can be applied in the real world. And so when you have multiple content areas to teach students within a given day, if you can find a way to tie that subject matter into the project that students are working on, they're getting the opportunity to see how these different subject areas work together. So for instance, I know a group of teachers down in Florida who are doing a PBL project with their students that's helping to save the manatees. So to do this, students will have to learn about the manatees, but also about their ecosystem. Well, this is science class. They're also writing persuasive letters to city officials to help protect manatees. This is language arts class. They're using graphs and charts to study the populations of manatees math class, and they're creating posters to put up around the school to raise awareness about manatees, art class, and lastly, they're looking at the impact that human growth and development has on the environment and their areas that they live and what role they can play in all of that, which is social studies. But now these students are motivated to learn all of this content and subject matter, not just because that's the expectation of being in the class, and it's not even just for grades or even personal achievement. They're learning the content to save the manatees. That's the project. That's the purpose and authenticity. And it's the primary driver of student work and engagement during that unit. And the thing is, teachers aren't having to teach the content in a brand new way. 
they can still use best practices to deliver the material. You know, if a teacher has some great worksheets that teach persuasive writing, they can keep using them, only now they can preface the writing activities by saying, we are going to write letters to try to persuade city officials to help take care of manatees but we have to make sure that our letters are really convincing. And there are certain things we can do to make that happen. So let's learn persuasive writing. Let's practice. And here's a worksheet that can help you with that. You see, it's not abandoning or replacing how you teach. It's enhancing it with authentic motivators. Now, it can take some practice and creativity to come up with authentic projects and figuring out how to tie in content standards. But I have found over and over again that the more we collaborate with other teachers doing the same thing, and the more we can just try it and learn from the experiences in project-based learning, the easier it gets and the more students are hooked on working and learning in this way. And one more thing. If you teach in an elementary classroom, know that you can do project-based learning, and yet oh, not everything science. has to be project-based learning. It's okay to say, all right, we are going to work on this project for a bit. And then at some point later in the morning say, all right, we are going to pause the project for now, and we are going to go and do reader's workshop. Not everything has to be PBL, but the more we can help students find purpose in their work and in their learning, the more they're going to engage with it. And so if you're going to do the Save the Manatees project, what if for Reader's Workshop that week, you found books that relate to the project in some way, so that while they're learning reading skills, it can be applied to this project that students care about. And so my challenge to you, especially if project-based learning is new to you, would be to take one unit that already exists and ask the question, how can I make this more authentic for my students? What problem could they solve while they're also learning this material? Answer that and you've got a PBL project. Okay. So I really like that guy. I liked his message. Can you do? Oh, there we go. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. It wasn't that we're going to reinvent the wheel, but rather just accentuate what we already have, right? So now to get your project based learning juices flowing, you might want to come up with a question that you want to try and solve. So um, this is where I feel like I have a ton of ideas because my three boys like to ask a lot of questions at this age. Um, <clears throat> just yesterday, my son was wondering why the baseball didn't move as far as the golf, as far as the golf ball when he hit it with the golf club. So this could perfectly tie into the grade in grade one science. They talk about movement of an object and what influences the movement. I also think this could fit into the grade three organize, uh, energy organizing idea. Um, but it's just that simple question that you can run with, right? My other boy, my, my youngest, he uh, he's three and he just finished swimming lessons, was not a fan. And he wanted to know, you know, why he sinks. He wants to know how he could just walk on water. And if he could walk on water, then he wouldn't have to do swimming lessons again. Um, and I laughed about this because uh, it perfectly fits into my grade eight lesson on density, like perfectly. So I thought that was pretty funny. But um, this same youngest child, I don't know if you have kids, but that youngest one, he's my big old slice of humble pie. He <laughs> he's the one who, you know, he wasn't listening and I'm calling his name over and over and over. And eventually I'm like, are your ears working? Like, are you deaf? What's going on? And without missing a beat, he hears that and he turns, what is deaf mama? And he smirks, like he knows what he's doing, but you know, I opened a can of worms when I said that, because then he really wanted to know what deaf was and ears and all the things. And so if you look at that grade two energy, they're talking about sound and behavior, right? And so the idea of it perfectly fits in. And yes, I agree with Kristen that choice boards to get them to buy in more. Um, I'm coming from a place where I have kids and I feel like when I compare my kids in elementary to my students that I'm teaching in junior high, I'm envious of the buy-in in elementary. Like I, uh, the junior high, I feel like I have to sell everything. and I see my boys, they're a little more uh, excited about the ideas, right? Now, 
I have links on the next couple couples or the next slide that I'm going to give you. But honestly, if you Google this, there's, I didn't want to limit it, but they're everywhere. There's so many ideas. Now, before we get to those links, um, I want to say a few things, right? Um, when you're doing project-based learning, you want to collaborate and you want to start this project at the beginning. It's the hook that we're using to capture the student's attention. So in my word, if or my idea, if we go back to the phasings of learning, we're starting with that transfer, we're introducing the transfer, and then we, we're going back to surface deep, surface deep, surface deep, and then transfer, right? But we want to introduce it at the beginning. Projects are varied. They don't, it doesn't mean that you're just going to build a diorama. It doesn't mean that you're just going to stand in front of the class and speak publicly, but it could, right? But there is a lot of wiggle room with these products. Um, they do need to be done at school. You can't really assess the work done at home if you know, don't know who did the work, right? What matters the most is the demonstration and application of knowledge. So not how much glitter is used on the poster, but you want to make sure that you're assessing the science cusps. And if you're assessing other cusps from other subjects, you want to be clear about that. So here's some links that I have for you. On the top left right here is the ARPDC resources. Um, unfortunately, at first glance, it might look as though they're not, there won't be a lot of um, resources there, but it, they're uploading every day. And when you click on a link there, once you open up the, the card, the resource card, there are a ton of documents and resources within one resource card. So it's important to click and search. Um, the Learn Alberta logo, click on that. Um, if any of you had me back in April, I did a few presentations on this. If you click on this link, you can filter your resources and the resources are constantly increasing every day as well. Um, moving to the right, those science snippets. This has been created by Edmonton Public to support teachers getting started with implementing the Science K-3 to curriculum. So check that out for lots of activities in there. Um, Edmonton Catholic has created what they call curriculum crates, and I'm sure a lot of you know that. Click on those for those fantastic resources. Um, in the middle row, we have Chinook's Edge, where you're going to see um, a ton of resources. You just want to click on the grade at the top, and that brings up resources for just that grade. Now, this ARPDC link in the middle, um, it is extra information on project-based learning. Um, I'm still constantly trying to strive and improve my own classroom and projects, and I found this document very important and helpful and interesting. And so if you want to check that out, that might guide you. Um, I did notice... There was someone who mentioned P uh, Michelle, PBL works. So there's that link right there. It's um, I really interesting. I really liked that link. So thanks, Michelle. Um, scope and sequence on the right hand side. This is another doc or er, resource given by Edmonton Public. And at the very bottom is a website that 55 ideas for project based learning. Now, I like that the simplicity is in this one when you click on those links and it doesn't have to be as crazy as you might anticipate it. Um, Corey, other uh, resources, specifically grade one. So there was, when I searched Corey, there was one and I, on, I honestly just checked out, there was um, Pinterest and there was a blog this lady had um, and it was PBL in kindergarten. And it was so cool because um, I think she was trying to teach about how animals move. And so they pretended to have their own zoo and people every day got to dress up differently or whatever they wanted to do, right? Whether they wanted to be the zookeeper or if they wanted to be um, the person 
coming in as a guest or if they wanted to be the lion, right? And they had to do a little bit of learning to figure out how each animal works so they could pretend to be that animal. Um, but it was, it could be as basic as you want it to be, right? So I do think it is attainable for kindergarten. I hope that helps, Corey. Okay. Oh, I think I skipped a page. Just a second. There we go. So this big picture, I hope you've seen this document before, but or this chart, but if you haven't, no big deal. Um, there are seven organizing ideas in science K to three. Matter, as you can see on that top row, is in K to six. Um, space. Uh, in your opinion, sorry, I got distracted. Hi, Tanya. Uh, in your opinion, will it be challenging teaching a grade one, two split with the new science curriculum? You know, I think there's some wiggle room out there. Um, I think there could be things where you're just elevating your expectation for two a little bit, depending on how you want to teach it. Um, but the fact that there's organizing ideas, I do think they could do the same kind of idea, but then obviously there's different cusps. But they're, they do relate a little better than the previous curriculum, in my opinion. Um, so kindergarten, if you look at this, kindergarten has four organizing ideas. They have matter, energy, earth systems, and then computer science. Grades one to three all have the same. So they have six organizing ideas matter, energy, earth systems, living systems, computer science, and scientific method. Um, so for today, we're just focusing on matter, but obviously there's lots of other organizing ideas. So science should be 10% of the day in kindergarten grade one and two. So this approximately equates to 30 minutes a day or one hour a week in kindergarten, 30 minutes or two and a half hours a week in grade one or and the same thing in grade two. And in grade three, science jumps to 15% of the day. So this equates to 45 minutes or 3.75 hours, three and three quarter hours per week. So I hope this helps. Um, in your initial plan for a year plan. If it was me, I would leave September for classroom routine, reading, math, right? I would also introduce and reiterate scientific methods and computer science concepts through STEM challenges. I think September would be a great opportunity to get them into the routine of scientific methods through introducing STEM challenges. Um, just yesterday, I was looking for STEM ideas, and I signed up, and I'm getting all the emails. So there's a ton of resources for STEM challenges out there, and it gets them excited with science, right? So that could be September, if it was me. Um, salt and pepper, I'm not going to break out into a song, but this is where the way I see scientific methods and computer science. I would sprinkle it on everything. I think it would be a daily thing that I have those in my lessons um, with all the other organizing idea cusps. I would also think that I would leave June for some activities, some wiggle, wiggle room. Um, track is huge and maybe it's just our hometown, but it was crazy how busy it gets in June. I always like leaving some wiggle room in case we get behind. Um, so in my mind, I would leave September and June not for science, right? So when you do that, then ultimately you can leave more time for science in the other months. Um, but ultimately you do you, right? So um, if in kindergarten, I would include the computer science throughout the year. So that leaves three other organizing ideas. If you don't include September or June, you would have about eight months to do these three organizing ideas. So all of a sudden you have a ton of time. That's about two and a half months per organizing idea. 
Um, for grades one to three, I would also plan to include in computer science and scientific methods throughout the year. If you don't include September and June again, you roughly have eight months to do four organizing ideas, which would be about two months per organizing idea, right? But ultimately, you can do whatever works for you, right? I like that you don't have to do it one way. There's lots of flexibility this way. So another idea I came up with that I would be inclined to do would be to have science camps. So that's where you flip flop science and social for an entire month. So you have lots of science and no social, and then you flip. It might be easier to get some, uh, get to that transfer phase of science, right? Um, in the next breath, this is so bad, but I'm thinking like, ooh, I don't know if I could do a whole month of just social. <laughs> like, that's a lot, um, but it's whatever works for you. Okay, so we're going to make a very quick year plan just to get your head going. Um, on the next slide, you're going to click on the link for your grade. It will prompt you to make your own copy. So you're just going to click on the blue button, make a copy. Um, if you click on the curriculum link at the very top, you're going to read through the chart and make some notes on the chart of what comes to mind. If it was me, I'd have like a split screen where I'm scrolling, scrolling through the curriculum and writing my ideas in the, in the chart. And then page two is to come up with a basic year plan, thinking about keeping weather and activities in the community and school in mind, as well as holidays. So a week of science, a week of social. Oh, I like that, Sharon. Cool. So if I was to click on grade one, it's going to force me to make a copy. So you just click on that. And there's two pages. So the first page, what I would do if I were you is to click on this curriculum link. Thanks, Chris. Um, I would make it bigger. And so the matter organizing idea, if I'm reading through these ideas and I'm focusing on the understanding, then I'm going to go back and I want to just come up with simple things that I can think about as I'm reading it. This is just an activity to get my brain working. Um, I've included all of the organizing ideas, not just matter. So scroll through and come up with a few ideas. Maybe this is the first time you've seen the curriculum and you're going through it. Maybe you've already planned your first unit. But I, I understand that there's going to be uh, an array of people listening to me right now. But And then the next page would be just trying to get it down on paper. I think a lot of times my anxiety lowers greatly when I finally get something down on paper and I can see it and there's a tangible plan. So if it was me, I would leave September and June for some wiggle room. September, I think it's really a great idea to start with routine, but you can teach those scientific methods and routine with STEM challenges and getting them excited for science. Um, so for grades one to three, if it was me, I would have about two months per uh, organizing idea. And when I look at the organizing ideas, keep, uh, keep in mind the weather and what do you have going on at the school. I know with my grade seven class, it was so exciting um, to have such a beautiful spring that we finally had our plant lab work. <laughs> no plants died this year, <laughs> um, but obviously I... I you need to have it at the right time of year. I was coaching a first year teacher and I gave her all my stuff and I was telling her what she was doing and she immediately went white and she's like, oh no, I just did the plant lab before Christmas. I'm like, oh no, 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 no. What were you doing? So that kind of thing, right? Where in grade seven, I like to do heat and temperature right before Christmas because we drink a lot of hot chocolate <laughs> while learning about heat and temperature. Um, and so it's just knowing 
weather and what works best for those cusps. So I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to look through your curriculum and to do this step one planning document. Everyone has their own document, I should say that as well. And I'll be here if anyone has any questions. I think you totally could, Joanne. I'm just reading your comment to could you use create this template for the grade four cusps? I would think so. Sure. Thanks, Corey. Yes. Christine, I love that idea of the tomato sphere. Cool. Hi, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so for the, I'm um, seeing the slide, your planning template. Mm -hmm. So when I click it, grade three, it just flips back from like, smaller screen, bigger screen, smaller screen, bigger screen. I'm not sure like where the links are oh. in the slide. Can you try the ones that are in the chat box? Oh, the ones kind of up above where you had sent for grade three. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah, those will, we'll have to check the slide deck. Um, I just got a message come up on my screen that due to the fact that all of you have been shared out the slide deck, um, we have an overabundance okay. of views, and that's what's slowing down. Oh, I did see that. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm just studying more coffee. <laughs> no, all good. Okay. <laughs> right there. We can ask everyone to mute themselves, please. Do you have a button as well? Yeah. All right, just have a seat and we will call you by name shortly. Thank you. <laughs> the time we checked in. Sorry, you guys, I'm not able to see on the screen who has their phone uh, up, but could you please mute your phone? Yes, I will be um, sharing a PDF version of my presentation and they will email it to everyone who's registered.
Okay. So you know what? I think I'm just going with some of the comments. We are going to jump ahead. I do have a plan for a collaborative doc where we're all going to share documents and ideas because I think that's more useful and user-friendly than the chat box. So let's get, if it's okay with you, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, stay with me, I promise. <laughs> So like I said earlier, I'm going to focus on the matter organizing idea. Remember when we talked about the surface deep and transfer phases of learning in project based learning, you're introducing that project at the very beginning, but then you keep building on your surface and deep levels of learning. When the students are applying what they know to the project, they're now in the transfer phase of learning. So for the next four slides, I have come up with a project, a basic project but an idea for the matter organizing ideas. Now, I do not uh, pretend to be a current classroom teacher for K to three. I'm currently in junior high. However, I have these boys that I get ideas from. So um, with kindergarten, I was thinking about going to those various field trips around town. And I like this because I know my son who was just in kindergarten went to all these places. And so I think it directly relates into social as well. But as a class, you're going to want, and this is after they've already demonstrated their knowledge of the five senses. But as a class, once we figured out those five senses, you're gonna go to each of these locations using their five senses and you're gonna describe the objects. You're going to note the properties of each object, right? You're going to record these observations. You want to take pictures and videos of the objects. And then once back in class, you want to describe these objects that you found at each place. And then I thought about maybe having the mayor, if you're in a small town, maybe the mayor comes in, who knows? But the mayor asking the kindergarten class to create a guess what game or something like that, where they have to play throughout the community. Um, they want to describe the objects using the five senses. And then, you know, the next page could be the image. So like a guessing idea. So you're describing all the senses and describing properties of an object and then having people guess what it is. I, I think that my son who's six would be all over this. He would love the creating a game and leading a game for other people, right? For grade one, um, I, I thought about packaging problems. So um, students, if you forget this cusp for grade one matter, you can go back and look at my earlier slides. But I thought about that students need to mail a variety of items. So, you know, paper, pipe cleaners, Play-Doh, rocks, styrofoam, popsicle sticks, etc. But they need to fit inside a certain box. Students will describe the properties of the items. They need to then figure out how to get the items in a certain box. And so through trial and error, the students will eventually figure out that they have to physically change the objects to get them inside the box, which is one of the, the main understanding ideas, right? Um, I think it would be fun in grade one to introduce maybe a thought book for this and whether it's a visual book or they use words, but a great way of showing their learning with the project and the progression of learning. Um, just last week, uh, we were, I don't know if we have much gravel left on my driveway because my kids go out and are constantly trying to figure out the best rocks that's the smoothest, biggest rocks that they can paint on. So this could be an activity that you do for properties for rocks and sticks is to find, you know, the smooth, the longest, the widest, and you're talking about all these characteristics of an item and then they could paint them. We paint a lot of rocks at my house. So this relates back perfectly. For grade two, my idea for this, for matter, is to have a three little pigs steam design challenge. So I would introduce this idea the very first day. 
And then you go back and you constantly go back to those concepts and the surface and the deep level learning. You would test various materials to see which properties are the most desired. You would discuss, identify, sort which materials would be natural versus processed. So if you click on this link, it actually goes to a website where I got the idea from, and I think it fits really well into the matter organizing idea. And obviously, I never follow anything to a T, but the suggestion is there, right? For grade three, my idea was to have the students write a circle story emphasizing the concepts listed below. So um, you want them to talk about materials that can be natural versus processed, that matter can change state if heated or cooled, um, solids, liquids, and gases have distinct properties, melting and freezing points are depending on the substance, um, obviously the water cycle, and then permanent versus re reversible changes. And this is just we're exploring the cusp with activities, but then you want, you constantly relate it back to the story project. Now, what I like about this is that it's, I see this connecting with the language arts grade three curriculum perfectly because it asks students to write a circle story. Um, this would work great with the water cycle because it is a circle. It's a cycle. We're talking about the evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and again, right? So, I think um, killing two birds with one stone, so to speak. <laughs> Are I supposed to teach? I'm really bad at going back to the chat. I apologize to everyone. Um, is there any good PD still available? Um, Chris might be able to help Belinda. I'm not sure. Um, the three. Belinda, if you just want to put, just send me an email at the end of the session, and I can give you some links to go to. The Three Little Pigs is a good book for the parts of the story, especially if you love the original. Perfect. Yes. Oh, Chris, can you put that? Marble Maze. I love that. You know what? The Marble Maze, I saw a really cool Marble Maze. I was so fortunate to go back. Um, Corey, I got to go to the National Science Conference in Atlanta earlier this year with a colleague. And my colleague taught Bio 2030, so I was not in many sessions with her, um, but there was the coolest marble maze. And then they, instead of a marble, after the marble, they used um, lights and talking about reflection and you could have a light maze. And it was like the same box. So in grade eight, I have to talk about light and optics. And so I, it was really, really cool. So Corey, I would, if you're doing a marble maze and you have to do light maybe, Check out that. But yeah, the circle story, if we go back to that, I just think it would it fits in perfectly with grade three language arts as well. And it totally is how you talk about the water cycle. So, okay. So this is my next idea. Um, we're currently on slide 44, if anyone's jumped ahead. I'm that person that always jumped ahead. So I sympathize, but um, you're going to click on the link on the next slide. This is a collaborative document, so hopefully we don't crash Google with all the people. Um, but each chart is a different organizing idea. And my idea is that we're going to fill out the gray areas. So if you guys have links uh, or ideas, put them in there. Everyone's going to have the same thing. So instead of describing a website, just put the link in there. I think um <clears throat> we're not on an island all by themselves and I truly believe that let's not reinvent the wheel like let's lean on each other and everyone has something to offer um so we're all going to work on the same document but if you click on whatever grade you have something to collaborate with or you want your teaching next year or maybe you have something to share whatever um but you click on it and it's going to, everyone's going to be on the same document. And um, if you had any ideas for a project-based learning idea, you would go up here. Um, maybe something that you wanted to think about, like, oh, this would work better if it wasn't minus 40, <laughs> you know, put it up on the dates. Um, 
if you have any resources, this is where you would share it and maybe ideas on how to get out of the classroom. Um, as a teacher, but also as a parent, I think as soon as you can get them relating to real life situations, you're winning. So trying to get them outside and nearby options to experience learning, it would be best. So if you have any ideas, we're all working on the same document, but I have put in, and again, it's all of the organizing ideas. I've color coded it so you know which one you're on. I did this with a group of wonderful people up in St. Paul um, a few months ago, and it was so well received. So I thought this was a good idea to collaborate. And then everyone has the same document. So far, we're not crashing Google, Chris. So this is a win. Is my camera working, Chris? Yes, so you're all okay. good. Okay. So lots of people had put great ideas in the chat box. And I find the chat box, you know, is so good, but I want to put it in a document where I can actually use it again. So please, please, please share. I had another question yeah. um, while people are working. So I'm new to teaching a combined grade next year, and I haven't ever taught the grades I'm teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm finding these sessions are awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But then when I go to like figure out, because I have this summer, I'm not going to work all summer, but I definitely want to utilize the time that I have. We're not really going anywhere. Totally. Um, so I guess my question is, should I be focusing on the two documents that you, we are, have utilized today in the session and maybe just because I'm going to start with matter, I've decided. Mm -hmm. And should I plan like some STEM projects, right? Like familiarize right. myself with the curriculum. Right. And, and, you know what I mean? And like, have you been coached or have you been encouraged to organize your split class a certain way? Because I've had friends, I've personally never had to do a split, but my friends, I've seen some where they cycle it. And then there's others where they actually teach all of it, but in separate groups. Do you know what you're doing? No. See, I guess I'd have to figure that out first. It almost sounds like it would be easier to cycle it, but it sounds like everyone in my school doesn't do that. They do it the other way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it depends on the school because I know um, there's a very small school my friend teaches at and they encouraged him to cycle it, but then I think larger schools wouldn't. Um, yeah. I know in our hometown there's a grade two class and a grade three class that are too big for one class, but not big enough for two. And so then you have like a two, three split. Yeah. To make it work. And so that teacher I know had taught every, they had to teach everything, but um, to coordinate with the grade two teacher and the grade three teacher that there's some that you could jive with, right. That you could work and do the same ideas because essentially next year the kids are all going to be intermingled again yeah so um because yeah like I say I just it's almost like I start spinning and then like I don't even know where to stop and focus on so maybe I should just familiarize myself with the curriculum for three and four yeah say yeah. just for like matter and yeah. then figure out how and look at the other curriculums like LA and math and how I could lap overlap them yeah Right? Like, oh, would that be a good story three, point? Like, the sorry? circle story. Yeah, totally. And so, just to not even focus on like hammering out like long range plans and like schedules, because I don't have a lot of answers in that regard. Yeah. So, maybe just to look at the bigger picture and start fleshing out projects. So, it's not like I have to start from scratch when I like totally hit the ground. The biggest jump time. for your grade fours is that there's going to be space. Yes, I saw that. To have one more organizing idea than the grade threes have. Yeah. They're just going to be a lot more crunched for time. Like your, your time won't be the exact same of like two months. If you were to do it, like I was going to where two months 
an organizing idea, right? Yeah. Um, but I think to get your legs underneath you, I still would keep September for routine and reading and STEM and STEM is so good for introducing computer methods and scientific or scientific methods and computer science. And so that would be, you know, the first couple of weeks of how to get your legs underneath you. Do you know who your counterparts are teaching the other classes? Um, how they're no, see, it's like we overlap for one day, but it was chaos because it's the last day. So yeah, I have no answers. I've been trying. Um, one of them said to like email her in July, but I'm not getting responses back, which I get it. It's the summer. Yeah. Yeah. So then maybe what I'll do is focus on what you said to do for September and maybe even just think of like a, activities for matter, like just kind of yeah. get my toe in there. there Kristen, is, are you um, intending to do the new four or the old four? See, I'm waiting on that answer as well for my NCIS team. My principal gave me the green light. Okay. Um, and I know teachers are, we, I would be allowed to though, right? You, like, I don't, you need to you need to clear that with your admin to find out what their thinking is as well to my admin said that sounds wonderful that's a okay. really smart idea make sure the ncis team is on board with it yeah. so the new curriculum i don't even know what that stands for <laughs> so you might want to even just look at there's some documents that have the concepts for each of the organizing ideas they're already developed and so that you can see what are the big rocks that live in grade three because you're going to have to do some backpedaling anyway from a grade three perspective to pick up in matter the things that they needed to already know from kindergarten grade one grade two yes uh, neither your threes or your fours are going to know that so there's a common element of instruction that's going to happen for both grades right at the same time anyway Mm -hmm. And set up your STEM project or your project-based learning, whichever way you want to go, um, you can still instruct both groups together. And then you simply pause the grade threes to start working on your STEM project while the fours just move a little bit forward in that concept as they go forward. So it, it's doable. It's very doable. But there is going to be some, you need to spend some bridging time. And that could be September 2 where you pick up a, a little pre-assessment and do some bridging with them first to find out what they know as a collective group and then work from there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, but again, uh, people are teaching the new four, even though it's not mandatory. And I think I'm going to get a yes. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and start planning it that way. So all the sessions that Ted and I are putting forward, uh, we do K to six because there's a good element in the province that are doing four to six as well. So there is a matter three, a matter four already created and posted with resources and, and ideas. So you absolutely will have materials. You're not going to be sort of starting from scratch. That's for sure. Oh, great. And where, sorry, where is that? So maybe at the end of the session, um, Jess or, or I can take you to where all that will be so that everybody's clear on where to find the materials and, and then for sure, we'll make sure awesome. that you get that. Yeah. Okay, thank sure. you. I saw a question, Lori was talking about assessment on the report card. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but I believe it depends on the school division, right? Of what it looks like in the report card. It, it does. Um, you're only required to report on the learner outcome for any of your new courses. It doesn't matter what, what it is you're teaching. And so it depends then on your school board how they're going to upload that. In some scenarios, what they're doing is they are only putting the learner outcome on the reporting car, uh, document. And then what you're attaching behind the scenes are any of your assignments from any cusps that may come through um, to help meld that mark. In other cases, they are, are breaking it out into smaller chunks and using that as reporting. So it's very district driven um, and you really need to get that really clear first before you kind of know what your planning sessions will look like too because that will impact um, how, you, how you're reporting obviously is gonna impact how you're gonna put some of your things together.
Okay, I'm Danielle, I'm not sure I'm clear on what your question is asking. So I'll just unmute for a minute. I know in our district, we are working with our local uh, community, but there's, you know, it's hard to know what we are allowed to teach because I'm not Indigenous myself and what, but because in the new curriculum, there is quite a bit on the First Nations perspective. Okay, is this so, Jenny or is it, yeah, Jenny. Okay, sorry, yeah. I was looking at the wrong question. Um, so yes, you can teach First Nations um, perspectives. There is about 90% of what we have in our curriculum right now is definitely information that you can share with students, but, but there are also areas that you would want an elder to come in. Um, and so you're not going to, um, you're not going to teach things that have to do with creation. You're not going to deal with things that have to do with um, protocols, because those are things that an elder or a knowledge keeper would come in and help you with. But are there resources? Yes, we do that in each of the sessions as well. I do backfill as much of the First Nations materials as I can uh, and put those in there. And there is tons available. And then you also want to just sort of connect with the whoever is your local um, elder or whoever is helping support those um, that, that you would be able to. But there is a ton of material that you can teach. And we hear that a lot still that people are saying, I'm not Indigenous, so therefore I'm not allowed to teach it. Um, the answer is yes, we can, but we definitely want to inform ourselves. And so a lot of times too, in the sessions that Ted and I are giving you is we give you background information and it's not information that I would teach to the children. It's background information for the teacher so that you feel a little bit more armed going into teaching that particular topic. So again, those will be areas that we're going to continue to grow on. Go ahead, Rosemary. Hi guys, I was just gonna answer her question as well. Um, here in Fort McMurray Public School District, we have um, indigenous consultants in each school and each school has an indigenous an FNMI liaison and I'm the FNMI liaison for our school. Um, we are allowed to teach everything in the curriculum. We're not allowed to do smudging. If you're gonna teach about smudging, you must have an elder for that. Um, as a non-indigenous person, I am not allowed to do smudging or teach about smudging. Um, for like, I know I added in a lot of stuff into the document for FNMI, like land-based learning. Um, like you can have a trapper because we are fortunate enough here in Fort McMurray public district that the board is well advanced in indigenous education. And we actually have a list of indigenous, um, elders that are willing to come into the school and share their knowledge. So now it's, it's expensive. Um, but from my understanding, every school has an FNMI, uh, budget. So I would discuss with your principal about, um, having elders come in and do certain things, but the seven sacred teachings, we're allowed to do that. Uh, the way we do it here is we do a teaching a month and we tie it to Lee and me. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just the ceremony and the, the cultural, the sacred cultural aspects. We are not allowed to. Um, teach that like the gifting of tobacco I am not allowed to teach that I'm allowed to gift the tobacco but if I want to teach that tradition to my students I need to have an elder come in and do it mm. okay does that help yeah and Thank each you of your so areas much. that you live in will have different practices so it'll be really important as Rosemary has mentioned to just connect with your local elders or whoever is looking at that perhaps in your in your district office and find out what the expectations are and I'll, I'll give you a good example um, first nations was my portfolio when i worked as a director and we had 19 different schools all within the same area but what i wanted to point out was that we purchased teepees for every school and when you live in Cree territory, that means that you don't necessarily have the same rules. And this is not, not specific to Cree, but you need to understand what the, the expectations of the elders in each area are. So in some cases, uh, we were allowed to put painting and designs on our teepees. In others, the elders absolutely would not have that. And typically Cree teepees don't have patterning on them like the Blackfoot would have. 
uh, we would set them up outside in June, we would set them up in the school in January. Some elders said teepees cannot go in the school. So you really do need to find out who is in your area that would have some say in that. So that'll be important to, to have that. I just wanted to put up, um, Michelle had shared this great link. So thank you, Michelle. Um, this link is in the chat box and it is lists of books for every organizing idea. I This is awesome, holy. So I would totally encourage you to open this up, make a copy, yeah. Yes, you're welcome. Although it does not say that it's, um, it is from our Red Deer colleagues, Red Deer Public. They put this together. I don't know how much time they spent, but I was given permission by their science director in that district to share this. So That's amazing. feel free to take it away, share it away. Yeah, this is so cool. I just didn't know which document to put it in because it's for everybody. So yeah, no, I thought totally. maybe you guys could That's, share totally it out agree. wherever. Yeah. I might have to just put this in every document. <laughs> so Michelle, would you be okay if we put this into a provincial document that we are creating, which hopefully will be all available to you by the end of August? <laughs> I think so. I was told we're allowed to share it. So great. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. And this is just so well done that I think it needs to be out there. Oh, and that's why we're working on this collaborative document. Because I was like, okay, let's just work together and get some things so we have less stress. But Yeah, this is phenomenal. Is. I'm adding tons of stuff. So there's Good. lots, yes, lots of places to add things. Is I'm not, yeah, this document will definitely be accessible after. Um yeah, so you totally have access to these documents after. Yep. Uh, obviously, everyone has access to it. So if you wanted to make your own copy, you can. That's fine. But I liked it because it makes the organizing ideas a little more usable and workable, right? Okay, guys, so we are going to, I'm just going to skip ahead and finish us up. We're almost done, but these documents uh, are definitely open for you guys to keep working on and sharing. Um, work smarter, not harder is my go-to motto. <laughs> so, oh my, there we go. Um, here's some more resources that I just wanted to share on slide 46. Um, you might be interested on them, but there's Sparkle Box, Mystery Science, Let's Talk Science. Um, there's some concept introduction activities from the ARPDC. These concept maps from the ARPDC are also pretty amazing. Um, the ARPDC website, I was going to show, I can't remember who we were talking to, Chris, that yeah. wanted to know where to find it. So if you go to the ARPDC website, and you go to new resources, um, you can find, you can search through science and let's say you want specifically grade three. So you go to grade three and there's going to be, the, you're talking to the celebrity herself right now, it's Chris. <laughs> um, but if you click on this, you're gonna view the resource. There's the videos, but then there's also extra resources down here, right? With the resources, um, so like I said, there's this card that doesn't appear to have much, but then it's the entire organizing idea. So, oh, uh, the link is not working, revamping their website. Oh yes, I knew that. I forgot about that. Sorry about that. Um, so I would totally encourage you to go to the ARPDC and search for all, if you click on any of these cards and then they from there like grade one matter you click on it you're going to view the resource and you're going to have a great explanation from chris and then you have all these resource files that you can download as well so a huge support right here um
the common sense education is a pretty cool website i mean check it out and then coming soon from the arpdc is these curriculum support documents that the consultants are working on currently um there's very there's it's going to be the plan is littered with activities for each cusp line so much like we're doing right now but it's going to be brought to you from all of the consultants correct chris you bet we can share a, a copy of it or we can let let them have a look at it if you want it depends on how much time everybody has So I hope you feel like you're leaving with something and that my title of putting it all together, that we maybe put it all together. I hope you don't feel too rushed because I was, okay, here's surface, here's deep, let's get to transfer, right? But understanding how each cusp line works and how to work with it, focusing on the understanding, um, the surface and deep phase learning planning documents, the familiarity with your new curriculum, hopefully, um, the basic year plan of how to break it down, um, the basic organizing idea uh, plans that we are working on right now, those collaborative documents, and then, of course, all the resources on all those links. So I hope you're feeling a little more supported. Um, now, if you have any questions at all, please, please, please email me. Um, I would love to help. And if I can't find an answer on a, in my own head or computer, I will seek out help. So um, I would totally encourage you to reach out. Thank you. <laughs> if all those co great comments, thank you so much. So very overwhelmed. I totally get it. I 